because I will probably be showing up in racing jurisdictions continuing to do what I've been doing. And that's trying to defend horsemen and provide some common sense to therapeutic drug regulation. Now, the large part of the talk uh, that I'm going to give has already been given. <laughs> uh, Claire and I should have you know, compared notes before we started this, because you're going to see some of the same information. And a lot of this has to do with some of the same stuff Rich talked about uh, because of the problems that exist uh, with the uh, medication regulation uh, rules. <coughs> so Quo Vadis, where have we been at? Where are we going? <coughs> well, where are we going is Quo Vadis. And of course, it's always nice to have somebody from Alabama who's lived in Louisiana for 30 years quoting uh, Latin <laughs> while they're in Colorado. <laughs> so where, where are we going? And of course, we need to answer the question of where we're going, in part by understanding where we've been, and that's Ubite. So uh, actually back in uh, 100 BC, you know, people were using a mixture of honey and water to stimulate horses in chariot races. And you know, that began the process of, of doping. And the word doping entered the English lexicon in 1899. In the early 1900s, uh, drug testing and racing uh, began with very primitive methods. And cocaine was the early drug of choice. In uh, France, the Russian chemist uh, Bukowski uh, proved that it was possible to detect drugs in equine saliva, and the methods detected strychnine, morphine, cocaine, and caffeine. <coughs> Obviously, uh, Claire and I were looking at the same information. Bukowski's methods <laughs> were adopted in Florida. Uh, in 1932, and this began the era of what was considered then modern drug testing. The late 1930s, uh, pre-race testing uh, was used uh, involving identification of crystals that could be isolated from the mouths of, of horses and injecting uh, rats with uh, urine or saliva to examine the effects on behavior. This wasn't the frogs, this was the uh, rat test that had a thing called straw tail. It's an effect on the central nervous system causes their tail to stand up in like an S shape when they're uh, administered a stimulant. In 1944, paper chromatography, which was an analytical method for the separation and detection of uh, drugs, was first introduced. And by extracting drugs, removing them from a lot of the water matrix of a sample and putting them on paper and running them with a solvent uh, in a tank, we could actually begin the process of detecting drugs and identifying them. And this process gave us the ability to see um, milligram, microgram quantities of, of drugs, and in some cases, even lower concentrations. A more advanced process was introduced in the 1950s, which was thin layer chromatography, still the same type of chrom chromatographic method. And at the same time, radio immunoassay using radioisotopes and antibodies to detect drugs was introduced. This wasn't being generally used in horse racing initially because it was uh, very difficult to raise the antibodies. It was difficult to, um, to use the materials, and people were not producing tests for a lot of the drugs that we were uh, interested in examining. Now, this was eventually replaced by uh, the uh, immunoassays that Tom was involved in developing, and a number of other uh, companies uh, where enzymes were used to produce colors that allowed us to see uh, these drugs at much lower concentrations, and more drug tests were being produced using amino assays uh, in the 1980s. Um, gas chromatography, which is something that was commonly used, uh, was introduced in the 1950s along with mass, mass spectrometry. So GCMS, and, uh, a term that you're probably familiar with, came along. In the 60s, HPLC, or high performance liquid chromatography, was introduced, became commercially available and different types of detectors that gave us the ability to see drugs uh, a little bit better uh, began to be developed. Uh, gas chromatography with various detectors to examine body fluids was first introduced in 1960s in Ohio. And again, this test gave us the ability to see microgram and nanogram quantities of drugs fairly well. There was quite a development in 1968. Uh, a gentleman named Dr. Michael Cole, Malcolm Cole, introduced what's known as electrospray ionization. What this allowed is that we could keep uh, drugs in solution and spray them into a mass spectrometer and do liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry. So it was the development of this technique that actually allowed that. But 
In doing this, uh, I've, I've been using mass spectrometer since 1976. We never thought that we would be able to do liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. Now it is the standard of the industry. Almost everything is done by that. But the first commercial liquid chromatograph mass spectrometer wasn't introduced until 1979. Of course, it was not until the 80s uh, and, uh, that uh, commercial labs could begin to uh, introduce them. The racing labs started to introduce them in the late uh, 1980s. 2010, uh, the exact mass high resolution mass spectrometer was developed. <coughs> They used ultra high performance liquid chromatography to very rapidly separate compounds and give very uh, good separation of, of peaks with greater sensitivity and uh, allowed us to begin to confirm drugs in the nanogram and picogram. Uh, and that, of course, depended in part on the method of sample preparation. Uh, since it, these instruments are much more sensitive, that it actually allows us to use a smaller sample size. So instead of using 20 to 50 mils of urine or plasma that we had to do back in the 70s, right, today we use 100 microliters, a uh, tenth of them, to do a lot of this testing. Well, that's where we've been. That's Ubite. Right. Where are we going? Well, we're, we're going to continue down the path that the labs have followed all along. We've introduced each of these individual methodologies in the laboratories as they are developed and as they became commercially viable and as we could afford them. But as you know, uh, race testing has been uneven across the country. And of course, this is part of what created some of the demand to improve uh, the laboratories, to improve the quality of testing, to increase the sensitivity. But most of that had to do with the funding coming from the state racing commissions. It didn't have anything to do with the quality of the laboratories. If the laboratories are given sufficient funds, they can do the same thing any laboratory does. So, despite all these advances uh, that we've had, there's still no single methodology that detects all drugs all the time. Right? And the more coverage requested or required, the greater the expense. So, again, that's one of the, the problems we fought over all these years, is that as there was a greater and greater demand, you know, to cover more drugs at lower levels, uh, the cost of testing went up. We had to, to use 50 ELISA tests. We had to buy more mass spectrometers. We had to buy better mass spectrometers. And um, that, of course, was not always able to be met by some conditions. And drug testing in some states was, was not what it should, be, should have been. But a number of states were able to do this, and they have advanced the industry a great deal. Matter of fact, we may have advanced it too much. <laughs> so newer LC exact mass methods actually may allow us, allow us to solve some of the problems of being able to detect more drugs all the time. Because the, the advanced uh, technology that we see today in exact mass, high resolution, mass spectrometers combined with ultra-high performance liquid chromatography allows us to take raw urine samples or raw plasma samples, do the minimum amount of treatment, and inject them directly. All right, so we can see everything that is in the sample. Usually when you do an extraction, you're extracting something you know, to, that takes advantage of the physical properties, the chemical properties of the compound over everything else. So you end up eliminating a lot of things and only isolating a few things. If you inject the sample directly, you see everything. And these mass spectrometers allow us to see high mass. We can look at peptides and proteins. We can see low mass. We can see down to 100 atomic mass units, which are very small molecules. Amphetamine is around 143, so you can pick that up with no problem. And of course, the other thing is, is that it allows us to do this now at picogram per mil levels. The instrument is actually seeing a level lower than that because we're injecting only a very small amount of the original sample, 10 to 30 microliters. So that's 0 .00, you know, 0 0.01 mils. Very, very, very small 
um, um, amounts of, of this sample. The problem, of course, is, is, is now come that with this ability to detect, laboratories have continued to report the positive result that they're getting. We can see drugs far beyond the ability of the drug to continue to exert any effect on performance. We can see the drug far beyond anything that could possibly have been related to an attempt to affect performance. And at some point, the instrumental sensitivity and the background contamination that, that Tom has mentioned, that others have talked about, will merge and no one eventually will be able to produce a truly negative result on any type of sample. If I were to take a sample from some of you, I may find drugs in your sample because of the limits of detection here that are being used in your household. You're not taking them, but other people are. And they, there are residues of these things at very low concentrations that are left on surfaces because drugs are not only excreted in urine and, and, and carried in blood, they're also excreted in sweat and the oils on the skin. So you can leave residues of these things around. And it's been demonstrated that you can go into a lot of homes and just do a swab and then elude that and test it, and you can see you know, residues of drugs that you may or may not have ever uh, come directly in contact with. So where are we going? Not to a good place, because there's a question that has yet to be answered. And we were talking about nanograms and picograms. Well, how about femtograms? When are we gonna get down to the ability to see femtograms? Picograms, or where we're, we're operating right now, and that's the, the bottom line there. And of course, there have been descriptions and different types of uh, comparisons for what constitutes a peak of it. But UBS finis, where does this end? Because when we get, when, when, when is a, a low drug level too low to call a positive? That hasn't been determined yet. I mean, currently, the laboratories and the commissions feel free to detect all as positives and prosecute picogram per mil levels. Who's going to be the first laboratory in the first racing jurisdiction in the United States, or perhaps in one of the other countries, to call the first positive at the femtogram level? A thousand times smaller than Who's going to get it? Minnesota. Minnesota. <laughs> Good luck to you. All right. Because we have picogram levels, then femtogram levels, then atogram levels, then septogram levels, and it has nothing to do with the Marx Brothers. And yoctograms, 10 to the minus 24th. And believe me, I never thought we would get to picograms. But we're right now, I can do femtogram levels if I extract a little larger sample. So if I wanted to make sure that no horse racing in the state of Louisiana ever came up negative, I'd just extract a bigger sample and run it on this instrument and I'd call some, you know, uh, femtogram concentration of a drug that's not regulated. It's in category one, two, three, and we got a positive. And that's what's happening in some of the other racing states already. You're calling picogram levels that have no pharmacological activity, have no possibility of having pharmacological activity. And you're prosecuting those people. Yeah, that's it. It's just not right. It's just not right. Our instrumentation, our capability has exceeded the rules, the law, what they were originally established for. And as Rich brought out very well, something's got to change. You've got to go back to these legislators and say, look, we're not doing what we were originally agreed to do. And I think I mentioned this several years ago. But the rules are wrong. They're not really looking at whether or not someone is being defrauded, whether or not someone is actually trying to cheat, whether or not the horse is racing under the influence of the drug, whether or not anybody was in danger. I guarantee you at picogram levels, none of that has happened. So have we already exceeded the limit? Yeah. Yeah. Too many cases, the answer is, is yes. A lot of the positives are being called now and we see them just you know, in referee analysis that we have done, in cases that I'm called about to, to examine the data, 
and <clears throat> then to provide testimony about that are just absurd. And if you look at the uh, medication regulation 26 compound list, a lot of those are at the peak of gram per mil level. How can you tell the difference between that and contamination? You can't. In very low, low levels, as Tom has just brought up in his talk, may continue to be excreted in the forest for prolonged periods of time. So a drug administered 120 days prior to a race that is detected by one of these machines, is that a violation? Well, we can detect it and confirm it. It's positive. Can we tell the difference between an old administration and contamination? Not when you go down to these levels. So contamination, contribution, and old administrations that may be in the record but still show up a long time afterward can still be treated as positive. So who's going to stand up and say enough? That we've gone low enough before we go too low or much further. It's going to happen. Here's just a little example. This is old data. We administered one microgram, right, one thousandth of a milligram of mepivacaine to horses, and then measured the level of the metabolite in urine. Well, for over a four-hour period, we was able we were able to pick that drug up. And if we had seen this in a, in a horse racing in Louisiana, it would have been positive. We administer 10 micrograms and 100 micrograms. Same thing. You see, 100 micrograms is, is just a tenth of a milligram. And believe me, if you're using the pivot you're going to use much higher levels of this. These kinds of levels can be in contamination. But we'll continue to see nanogram levels in some cases. And this is just for extremely small concentrations of drugs that get into the bloodstream of the horse. And if, it, uh, if the horse is exposed to it orally, some of that is absorbed, depends on the individual drug. It's called bioavailability. It will be absorbed, it will be in the bloodstream, it will end up in the urine, the urine will be screened, low levels will be detected, detected positives will be called. This is a category two. We did this data in 1990 before we even got our new master comment. This is what is, is going to become. You'll have to, the, the trainers, the veterinarians, the grooms, the hot walkers, the jockeys, the people in the test barn are going to have to be protected from the horses. And if they can figure out a suit for the horses, I think we're going to have to have that too. So the solution is re really easy. And of course, uh, people are working on this, and, and we have worked on this for a long time. Categorize the drugs, establish a penalty scheme that reflects the serious, seriousness of violation. Apply the science of pharmacology to the use of drugs and to the interpretation of the data from uh, detection and confirmation of drugs in quite samples. I mean, you need somebody to look at the data that makes sense. We categorized the, the, the drugs a long time ago. The problem I've got with this now is back in, in 1989 when Charles Short and Steve Kimberly and I did this, mainly Charles Short's work, right, we, we thought we were doing a good thing. But the categorization of some of the drugs today, it seems like every, every drug that comes along that goes before this committee that's categorizing these things makes it a category two. Right? Levain substance, right? levamisole, the common anaphylenic. Right? Yes, produces low levels of pimeline and low levels of aminorex, which are stimulants is now by itself. You don't have to show that there's any aminorex there. You don't have to show that there's any pimeline. You don't have to show that there's any uh, possibility of stimulation. But levamisole itself, which is an anthelminic, is now a category two. And it's being called at picogram per mil levels in some racing states. And they're being penalized as a category two. Makes no sense. Levamisole has no possibility of affecting performance. So, you know, I thought we had a good idea here, but now I think it's being abused. Penalty schemes, you know, we came up with a penalty scheme in 1989 as well that we thought was reasonable. And the, uh, ability, the, the need to standardize penalties along with medication rules across the country was, was part of this. But you are, you've already seen some of the racing states having much more severe penalties in, in these cases. 
you know, they, they're not trying to stay uh, within the lines. The same thing that has always happened. They're going outside the lines, and some of them are try, trying to be harder than the other racing states. Applying the science of pharmacology to, to the use of drugs and then the interpretation of the data requires that trace levels of equine therapeutics and drugs used by humans, uh, that thresholds be established for those. Because if you're going to use pharmacology to determine your regulations, you don't call people parents. And for some drugs, you don't even call them any parents. And you use the, the science of pharmacology to say, well, you know, even at this level, it, it doesn't do anything. So are we really violating why we're here as a commission right, by not calling this as a positive? But, of course, that's not what's happening right now. And in fact, racing jurisdictions that have adopted this racing medication therapeutic, uh, ARCI controlled therapeutic med medication guidelines, have bought a pig in a puddle. Right. That's one of my favorite terms. They bought a bill of goods. Because more and more of the withdrawal times and thresholds in, in this, uh, these guidelines are being proven to be built on a pillar of sand. And this was the argument that was used in the Fletcher case by the attorney Karen Murphy. She convinced the attorney general in the state of Delaware that there was no science there. And there wasn't. And part of the reason Fletcher's case got thrown out, I was involved in, in being a consultant on that case, is that when we asked for the science behind the threshold, RCI could not, would not produce it. We got one page that showed a graph. And what the graph demonstrated is they had not examined the concentration of methadone after, after administration out to the threshold time. So they knew nothing about how this drug was going to act, as Tom was showing for the xylazine, beyond a certain time. They had, they had, they had, they had bad data. Well, that's, they didn't just do that for xylazine. They didn't just do that for beta methadone. If you look at that entire list, like uh, Clara said, 19 out of the 26, there's no science that's available. Why the hell would you adopt something you know, as a rule, as regulation, for 26 compounds when you don't have science for 19 of them? And the science you put up as representing what that, where that came from on review shows there's no way you could have come up with that threshold from that information. But that's what was done. And one of the reasons it was done is the RMTC decided, along with the ARCI, that, well, look, we got a bunch of smart people together in a room, and they all came up with this. So trust us. You don't need to ask questions about this because we had smart people look at this, and they came up with this information. So. I think the smart people also got good week too. I think a lot of the recommendations that were made by these smart people got ignored. And, and a lot of and what it became is something totally different. It's just a move to, to try to eliminate drug uh, use altogether. <coughs> so, you know, there are a lot of different things we can do. And, you know, this is just a, a kind of a summary of things that I've been recommending for, for quite some time. And little by little, some of it I think may come around. Uh, Claire's talking about the new studies that are going to be being done, and that's a good thing. Uh, they certainly need to be. Um, we do need to talk to legislators about whether or not commissions are overstepping their, their bounds. But one of the things I do point to is, is this last statement here. The data that's being generated does need to be interpreted by independent experts, not stewards, not commissioners, not equine medical directors independent experts that, that know that drug, drug regulation should be based on the science of pharmacology, you know, good scientific data, should be interpreting this and informing the commission <coughs> whether or not a case should be pursued. And we could eliminate a lot of this. Because in, in setting up this, these guidelines, the number of positive calls has not gone down. It's gone up. And if calling positives does damage to the integrity of the industry, then what they have accomplished is more damage, not less. 
Clavatus. Is this where we're headed? More tracks being closed because more positives are being called because more horses and more horses are being held out. Is this what Toba wants? Thank you very much.